Hello anyone, everyone, and welcome to the Week Air Review. You can call me Stan, and today I'm talking about the recently released second season of You. It's a show that's had a fairly complicated development history. Based on Caroline Kepnes' novel of the same name, it was originally conceived in 2015 as a show for Showtime that Showtime wasn't actually interested in, nor apparently was Netflix back then. It eventually found its way onto Lifetime, which was so excited about the project that they actually picked up a second season before the series premiere even aired. Except it clearly didn't do as well as they had hoped, because they dropped that second season and the whole thing became a Netflix original. You was controversial for its decision to stay in the head of its monster of a protagonist, Joe Goldberg. I've talked in videos before about how a narrative committing to a character will inevitably result in empathy for that character, at which point it becomes more of a question of the audience's reaction to their empathy. You has always been a show that skewers a particularly gross masculine ideology, but if you don't realize it knows how awful its protagonist is, and it doesn't really get explicit about that until the back half of the season, then you might even think it's a celebration of that. And even if it isn't, I don't think it's invalid to argue that by giving itself over to Penn Badgley's Joe, it gives a fairly handsome face to an extremely dangerous belief system. Maybe that's not great. My response to that sort of criticism has historically been, well, people like this exist and it's worth attempting to understand them in something approaching their own terms. Bigger picture, I don't feel that way anymore, but I also don't think you is written on Joe's terms. And if it was at the start, it's certainly not any longer. You season two pushes back hard on its protagonist, giving a clearer voice to the criticisms while also complicating him in some interesting ways, but they're particularly interesting in the meta sense. We see more of his backstory, but rather than the bookseller who punished him with the cage, who we saw a lot of in season one, we're focused on the promiscuous mother and abusive father. As these flashbacks unfold, we see how his traumas have directly informed his actions decades later. But let's be clear, explanation does not equal justification. I know that some people like to believe that revealing their trauma from being locked in a kennel for a week means you have to forgive them for running over your dog or whatever, but obviously that's not true. And yet, sometimes you do it anyway. That's the show's real meaning, thinks Penn Badgley, who said in a recent interview that you is about how far people will go to forgive an evil white man. And that's true both narratively and conceptually. Given the things that Joe has done, that we have seen him do, the idea that he deserves another chance and another season is obscene. And yet I, and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of other people tuned in to resolve last season's cliffhanger. After he killed love interest Beck and pinned the blame on her therapist, it seemed like he'd gotten away with everything until Candace, his previous ex that we were all so sure he had also killed, shows up alive and seemingly well. She says they have to talk. What a sticky situation our murderous stalker of a protagonist has, and don't we all just want to see him find his way out of it? Look, television antiheroes are hardly a new phenomena, but most of them have some sort of complex motivation, right? Joe is kind of complicated, but his goal is not. And it's an explicitly personal and entirely selfish one. Love at any cost. If it leads torture and trauma and death in its wake, it will all have been worth it so long as he has his perfect life with a perfect wife who, among other things, appreciates the fact that he meticulously manufactured the circumstances of their meeting. And yet, you still want to forgive him his trespasses, believe that he can be better. Part of this is 
probably because he seems to believe it. He says constantly throughout episode one that he's not that guy anymore, that the weird coincidences running into new love interest slash possible victim Love Quinn are all over the damn place. Uh, they're just that, coincidences. And I fucking believed it, and you probably did too. Oh, there were signs that he was still the old Joe. It was obvious from the moment he pulled crime and punishment out during his job interview that that was some kind of trick to get a job selling books at Anavrin. But I didn't think through the trick. I was just like, of course. He wants to stay around books, but he has no kind of references, and he knew that this hippie commune was looking for a seller, and reasonably guessed that the guy would fall for someone who likes Dostoevsky. Despite having a liberal arts degree, I have not read Crime and Punishment. Still, its prominence made clear that there was some thematic connection, and indeed Wikipedia's ultra-brief summary sounds more or less exactly like what Joe experiences over the course of this season. I hope that someone does go deep on that if they haven't already. I won't read it, but it should exist. Oh, the stories we tell ourselves so we don't have to believe in monsters. Like that a grown man actually wants a private screening of a 15-year-old girl's experimental short film for the art. Or that that same man's hidden sex dungeon is full of kids' toys isn't a cause for concern. Which brings us to Henderson whose story is arguably as important to you season two as anything involving love, either the character or the concept. While we have seen other bad men in you before, they've all been nothing but bad, abusive, cruel, etc. They're wolves who do nothing to hide it. Joe is in sheep's clothing, and so is Henderson. And like the girls in Spring Breakers, or even Penn Badgley himself in You. My girlfriend calls him the boy next door of Gossip Girl, which slots perfectly into the affect that Joe tries to cultivate. Casting actual famous comedian Chris D'Elia as fictional famous comedian Henderson gives a level of visceral reality to the character. Even if you don't know D'Elia's comedy, you've probably seen his face. And at the same time Joe is decrying his celebrity, you're like, oh hey, it's that guy. Delia's comedy isn't really my jam, but I also don't have a problem with him, and indeed respect him immensely for taking this role. Because Henderson is emblematic of the forgiveness thing that Penn Badgley was talking about. Henderson is part of the entertainment industry, but he is specifically a comedian. And comedy is particularly male-dominated and has seen some disturbing and high-profile revelations in the era of Me Too and Time's Up, which makes it a really interesting case study in the impact and effectiveness of the movement. Bill Cosby's in jail, which is great, but Louis C.K. is about to do a comeback tour despite having made no effort to atone for his actions, so there's still a whole lot more to be done. The Henderson B-plot is an attempt to think about this on a lot of different levels. Henderson is a predator who is attracted to little girls. He drugs them and takes photos of them in different states of undress. He says that he doesn't go further, but whether that's true or not doesn't really matter. He violated their trust and them. And Joe feels compelled to do something about it, but Henderson is also widely beloved and honestly seems like a good dude. When Joe has his finger cut off because of a wild misunderstanding that is nonetheless entirely his fault and no one should feel bad about, Henderson tells him who to go to to make sure it's fixed. And it is. When Love's brother, Forty, falls off the wagon at a party, Henderson ends things early so that Forty can leave with something approaching dignity. You kind of want to believe that Joe's neighbor and survivor of Henderson's predation, Delilah, is wrong. But she's not. Of course she's not. All of Henderson's goodness masks evil. And now he's after Delilah's sister, Ellie, who is basically this season's Paco, i.e. neighbor kid Joe gives books and life advice to. Joe, overprotective as he is, decides to do something about it. And throughout this whole thing, I kept thinking about X, Daniel Sloss's special that I saw performed last February, that just hit HBO in November. It is an absolute must-see, particularly for men. And I rewatched it while writing this. 
it remains extremely affecting. Though he pauses a weird number of times to take a drink in the taping, which impacts the pacing slightly, and relevant to most of what I've said so far. But one thing I focused on in my review of the show and feel really applies here is Sloss's discussion of the hero complex, that capital M manly belief in one's ability to save the day, generally with violence, and the fact that the world just doesn't work like that. You knows it, uh, even if Joe doesn't. When Delilah isn't moving as fast as he would like in Ronan Farrow and Henderson, he breaks into Henderson's home and finds the photos he, that Henderson has taken of young girls. Anonymously, he gives them to Delilah, hoping that she'll be able to do something. And then she tells him, unaware of his role, that whoever swiped those photos is an idiot who made things harder, not easier. And so Joe takes things into his own hands again, resulting in yet another inadvertent death. This hits at the failings of Joe's methodology on multiple levels. First, tracking Ellie to make sure she's not doing anything dangerous fails because she figures out what's going on, though blames the wrong person and creates additional trust issues in an already fraught relationship with her sister, and then works around it because she's a teenager and obviously knows how to do that. His breaking and entering plan also fails because those photos he stole outside the context of Henderson's hiding spot do not implicate him in any way whatsoever. Finally, Henderson dies a beloved figure with his face plastered everywhere, ensuring the continued trauma of his victims. And look, I'm not going to shed a tear over it, but there's no catharsis, least of all for Joe, who has truth spit back into his face by the man he doesn't know he's about to kill. The two of them are the same. There's more to this whole thing that I don't really have time to get into, specifically around Delilah's story about her experience. It's not great that Joe's mansplaining of narrative journalism is ultimately validated, but I understand why it had to happen for character reasons. So the best stuff involves the fear she and others who may have otherwise come forward have about the whole thing, knowing that there would be retribution from crazed fans who refuse to accept the truth. Along those lines, the scene where Delilah and Ellie destroy Henderson's photos is arguably the most impactful of the entire season because it's frustrating, but also you know that it's the right decision. I know I said that Joe's goal is to find love, but in season two, I think there's something even bigger going on. He wants to prove that he is a good person. He feels some type of remorse for what he did to Beck, and he doesn't want to go down that road again. He doesn't want to hurt or kill anyone else. Of course, one of the first things he did after touching down in LA was kidnap a man and steal his identity. But it's just part of the journey, right? And anyways, he eventually lets the real Will Bettelheim go after the real Will makes very clear that he believes Joe is fundamentally a good person. But not everyone does. Candace obviously knows for a fact that he's bad, and Delilah doesn't trust him at all. Ellie is pretty sure that he wants to have sex with her because she lives in the world, which is where men live, and men are awful. His immediate revulsion and comment about never putting his hand on a kid is one of the first times we've seen him draw a genuine moral line in the sand, but it's quickly followed up with him grabbing Ellie and knocking her phone off the building, and even if he immediately realizes what he's done and stops, still felt a little on the nose, but I was still surprised by the end of the episode, so what does that say about me? Which brings us finally to the A-plot. Joe's pursuit of Miss Love Quinn, a millennial widow from a wealthy family with a hanger-on deadbeat brother. Although he stalked her, got a job at her place of work, etc. in order to be near her, Joe's decision to take things slow and steady regardless of Quinn's interest is kind of fascinating, particularly because it's so frustrating. Again, he believes he is trying to be a good person, to atone for the sins of his past by never repeating them. He knows that he could hurt her, as he has in the past, when things progressed too quickly, and they all realized much too late 
that no one was who they thought they were. He thinks she's really special in a different type of way. And so he wants to make sure everything's in the clear before committing physically the way he's obviously committed mentally, whether he accepts that or not. But it's a different kind of cruelty. He's hurting her emotionally rather than physically with his desire to be friends but wanting to do romance, causing understandable irritation and anguish for Quinn, someone who was devastated by the loss of her husband far too young. Playing with the emotions of someone like that is straight up fucked. Joe is eventually faced with this and gives up on that selfishness to focus on playing the good boyfriend. Although I find the constant inner monologue thing to be a bit much at times, it's most effective when he's trying to put a moment into the bigger picture. How should he handle this thing? How does he come out of this? Being a good person, not like the person he was before, the person he believes he really is, and the one good enough for a woman whose actual name is love. And he really does try. It's almost admirable the knots he twists himself into in order to be good, but it all comes crashing down around him. From the moment that Delilah finds his glass cage in the storage locker, her fate was sealed. Joe's idea to give her the time-locking handcuffs and then actually leave the country when she gets out so that she can do the things she has to do but he'll be safe is, all things considered, a pretty good solution that doesn't involve anyone else getting hurt. So when Joe is fake kidnapped by Forty and forced to work on a script based on Beck's posthumously released novel that no one knows he helped write, it's almost sad, but something's got to give. In general, I think that episode flawly encapsulates this forgiveness thing. Once the timer starts, it is so incredibly tense. But it's only tense if you, like me, are rooting for Joe to escape. And none of us should be doing that. This guy deserves to go down. But he's changed, right? He's trying to leave on the kindest, most human note we've ever seen from him. And he's just being dragged back into the world. He should be caught. But I don't want him to be caught. And there's a gosh damn countdown. And I'm so stressed out. And then Delilah's dead. And Joe doesn't know how it happened. But we all know that it had to have been him. Because who else could it have been? And he tries so hard to deny it, but he knows deep down that it's the only thing that makes sense. That even though he tried and he promised that he wouldn't hurt her, he had no choice or whatever. And she became just another casualty. He knows now that he is irredeemable. And we see the realization when he's locked in that cage and Candace finally has the chance to take down the man who almost killed her. He has that secret key in the cage that no one else found, but he can't pretend anymore. So he drops the key outside and gives into his punishment. Until Love Quinn kills Candace. Because it turns out, Joe was innocent this one time. She killed Delilah too. It's a really good twist, because now Joe is faced with something he couldn't even fathom. Someone who loves him for the person he has spent this season trying not to be. Someone who is just like him, but someone who embraces that part of them instead of shoving it down. And he can't handle it. Before him is his reflection, but now he only sees the evil. In effect, he got Candace, or Beck, maybe. He thinks about Beck in there more than he does Candace. How Beck reacted to being in that exact position. He tries the same tricks she tried on him on Quinn, and oh, the irony of it all. And then it goes full on Gone Girl, as Joe is faced with the fact that Quinn is pregnant with his child, and what's he gonna do? Leave? Abandon his kid the way he was abandoned? No, of course not. He's gonna stay with the woman he is afraid of, and live the life that she will craft for them. It's hard to know exactly what poetic justice looks like for Joe Goldberg, but this isn't not it. Now reformed, he is in hell. He says that himself. Except he's not reformed. 
Through his fence, he sees his neighbor, just from behind her and her book list. He starts imagining her, the new you. The cycle begins anew, and it ends. And it should stay ended there. There will undoubtedly be a third season because this show is wildly successful for Netflix, and they will cancel shows that shouldn't be, and then not let shows die that should. And sure, maybe I should give more credit to the creative team that somehow pulled off a universally successful follow-up to that excellent first season, but this is genuinely the perfect ending for you. It is the culmination of everything that has come before and leaves exactly no questions that need to be answered. Where season one ended on a cliffhanger, Joe's reversion in the final moments of season two is simply a bleak restatement of the show's thesis. No matter how many times we have convinced ourselves that Joe has changed, there is no more pretending. We know who he is, has been, and always will be. And that's enough. 9.2 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hammer and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, at Blasian FMA, Magnolia Denton, and Elliot Fowler. If you like this video, that's great. If not, I'm sorry. If you want to see more, please watch my Hamilton rap, and also subscribe. I hope to see you next week.